Good morning, everybody. It is great to see people here in the auditorium. Uh, I've been down in the fellowship hall, and I got to see some of you down there. And um, we're getting to see us by camera that way, those in the parking lot and the pavilion. Uh, if you didn't hear Stephen's announcement, I just want to say it again. Um, we have some slides to follow along today. We're, we're trying to do some things that are a little different so that maybe those of you outside have something to see. Uh, and I have downloaded the sermon slides. They're part of our regular worship slides there. You just go to our website, www.oldunioncoc.com. And um, you'll see the uh, songs there in PDF or PowerPoint form. And if you'll go past the songs, maybe you're already there, uh, you're going to see my sermon slides. We're trying this new today. I appreciate those that have been working on technology behind the scenes. And I don't, if that hasn't been said, it needs to be said. Some of you have not been in the building, and that's okay. We want you to worship where you're safe. But I want to let you know some things that have been going on inside the building that you may not have gotten to see. And that is many Sundays we met in here, and it was really uh, Holden Dixon and a helper, uh, one computer, and or maybe two computers and a screen. Well, during this pandemic, we have graduated to uh, three screens, three computers, three projectors sometime, uh, and it's been quite the, uh, the, the, the expanding of our capabilities. I want to thank T.J. Spradling and John Fullerton, who are now putting together a camera system. Uh, we're going to be able to broadcast. Uh, they're practicing with that the next few Sundays and working on that, and some of you are seeing that in the fellowship hall today as an experiment. I want to thank Danny and Lena McCorkle, who have helped provide sound out to our pavilion. Uh, and Stephen, who has made sure that our radios out in the parking lot work every Sunday. Um, just a lot of things have been going on technologically. Um, thankful for our elders who, who have invested in that. Uh, sometime they invested in that long before we knew we were going to need it. Uh, and so we've had that website and, and other things uh, going on out there. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to go back to a time before technology. I want to go to Exodus chapter 2 today. Exodus chapter 2, if you'll join me there. Exodus chapter 2. In Exodus chapter 2, we're going to continue our series on Moses. Um, we're going to talk about Moses as leader. And so as we continue to look at the next slide on that, why study spiritual leadership? Why, why should we be interested in spiritual leadership in a time like this? Well, I think it's important for us to know that, first of all, God has chosen you to lead. Some of you led worship in your home for the first few weeks of this pandemic. Some of you are leading here, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but as some of you want to help participate in service, I know Stephen would appreciate that, um, as we need a few more Bible readers now, and, and maybe our song leaders are beginning to rotate. If that's an interest to you and you feel comfortable coming in the building, if you'll see him, I know he'll help you with that. But you don't just lead in this building. Um, your family needs you to be a leader. Your neighbors need you to be. Your neighbors have watched you during this time. You know, it would have been very easy to invite your neighbors to church during this pandemic. Why? Because it was in your house, right? They just had to cross the field. You could have sat outside in the driveway and listened to it together. And the church family here at Old Union needs you to be a spiritual leader. And I remind you, you don't have to have a title to be a leader. You don't have to be an elder. You don't have to be a deacon. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher. You don't have to be a preacher to be a leader. You're leading where you are. Some of you are leading and greeting, even in these times when we're not allowed to hug and handshake and do those things. I still see you walking around waving, and, and you're smiling behind those masks. Some of you are leading in service outside during the week in ways that I can't imagine. Um, but you don't have to have a title to be a leader, just willing to work with leadership. So we're going to look at Moses in Exodus chapter 2, verse 3 today. And where we find the children of Israel, and, and there's a map there that you can see, um, they are in what's called Lower Egypt. They are in Lower Egypt. And the Jews lived in the area that we would today know as Memphis. Now, it's very confusing, and I don't know if our slides are following me today, but we're on the one on the map. Um, Lower Egypt doesn't make a lot of sense because it's north. Right? I mean, when we think of upper and lower, uh, we usually think lower as south. Well, lower Egypt is north because that's where the Nile flows. The, the Nile flows north, and so at that lower end, that land of Goshen, you may remember Joseph had brought the family, he brought Jacob, they had settled there, and they've been living there now for several hundred years. And we think the Jews live there in the area of Memphis. 
You might remember in Genesis 45, it says, You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. And that's where they've grown up. Another Pharaoh rises that doesn't know Joseph. We looked at that a few weeks ago. Uh, they were killing Israelite children. Uh, Moses' mother defied the government in that uh, and sent him adrift, and he is going to be found by a princess. So as we look at the next slide, how is God preparing you how is God preparing you for your mission? You know, I think about this congregation, and I think about those that are here who come from different backgrounds. Some of you born in Sumner County, some of you born far away. Some of you have worshiped in this building only most of your life, and some of you have worshiped other places and bring those ideas to us. What have you learned in your life? Oh, boy. You got any life lessons in this room? Got any life lessons in the pavilion? Could we turn to each other and say, the biggest mistake I ever made was blank? Or the best decision I ever made was blank? What are the needs around you? Who at work is telling you something going on in their life and you're the only one they're telling? What are your passions? What are you passionate about? What skills do you possess? I love when God puts congregations together. And I don't know if you know that, it's not geography. Are you with me, church? It's not geography that puts congregations together. It's God. Sometimes I think it would be good for us to get a map out and all of us put a little pin where we live. Many of you do not live just a few seconds from the church. For the first time in my life, the last four or five years, I've got to live within a few minutes of the church. I used to drive an hour one way to go worship with the congregation. So, so what skills do you possess and where has God placed you and who needs your leadership? Who needs to see you be a child of God in these times? Well, as we continue to move on today, I want to start with a question. And there's one question that needs to be on our heart today as we look at Moses. Can you still serve God after falling into sin? Can you still serve God after falling into sin? Now, I'm not going to make you wait 20-something minutes for the answer. I'm going to answer it now so you can get past that and you can get into the lesson. You know what the answer is? Yes. I love it. The heads in here are going up and down. Yes, yes, you can still serve God after falling into sin. Now, be careful. There's a repentance process. There, 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 there may be a turning around. There may be a change process. But we're going to look at a man today who fell into sin and God did not discount him. Think about that idea of discount. We're, we're going to talk about that at the end. So let's look at today's story, if you will. I'm in Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. So we're not baby Moses anymore, right? When Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Now Moses had a special situation here. Remember, Moses was born Hebrew. He was set adrift Hebrew. But it is Pharaoh's daughter who rescues him, calls him Moses, drawn out of water, and he's raised Egyptian. Moses is in a society where he doesn't quite fit either one. The Hebrews see him as an Egyptian. They don't know his background. And the Egyptians know his background, and he was born into the Hebrews. He doesn't quite fit in. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. He is now finding himself aligning with the Hebrews. So he looked this way and that way. Had you ever noticed that in the Bible before? Before Moses did something, he looked to see if anybody could see. How many of you on a winter day have been walking and slipped on some ice? You didn't quite fall, but you kind of did the little dance. And you quickly looked around to see if what? If anybody saw you. Don't we all do that? Yeah, I see a lot of you kind of, yeah, yeah, we all do that. Right? He's looking one way or the other. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, when he thought he couldn't get caught, when he thought nobody would notice, and isn't that how sin is sometimes? Isn't that how sin is sometimes? He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses chooses to become a murderer and he hides his sin you know mankind really hasn't changed have we some of us have known that we were doing things that were not proper 
We just hope no one would find out about it. Sometimes when I catch a student in a situation that I know they shouldn't be in, may, maybe it's cheating or, or something else, I often talk to them about are they upset that they got caught or are they upset that they did it? Because those are different things. Some of us are just upset when we get caught because we got caught. We weren't smart enough to outsmart. No, you're, you're not smart enough to outsmart God. Let me go ahead and tell you. But sometimes we need to be sorry. All times we probably need to be sorrowful that we did it. So Moses kills the Egyptian. Continue on in the reading, Exodus chapter 2, beginning verse 13. And when he went out the second day, so the next day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? So Moses walks into a situation where he sees two guys fighting. These time they're, this time they're both Hebrews. He saw what happened. He says, why are you hitting the guy? Verse 14. Then he said, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you see the Hebrews' response to the Egyptian? Who put you in charge? You're not my mama. Anybody ever said that to anybody in here, right? Any, any of you ever get put as room monitor? You know, the teacher leaves and, and they left someone in charge, and boy, that person's head went, right? And you know, they're writing everything. Oh, you got out of your seat. I'm going to write you down, right? I'm going to tell the teacher that you threw a trash away, right? Any of you there? Right? Who made you judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Mm. What Moses thought he had done in secret was public. What Moses thought he had done in secret was public. So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of the matter, he sought to kill Moses. Now, guys, Moses had grown up in the Egyptian court. Pharaoh knew who Moses was. Uh, how close that relationship is, I don't know. But Pharaoh realizes someone in his family, uh, or are they his family? They've been adopted in, right? Has killed a, an Egyptian. What's, what is the reaction here? When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Moses has to leave. Moses has to leave a land that he is raised in to go hide because of something he did. I'm not sure that was his plan. I'm really not sure that was his plan. I want to talk for a moment about this sitting by the well. That, that's going to be important in the story. And so I hope that you will uh, picture this for a moment. Many times when we think of someone sitting by a well, we probably think of Jesus, right? We think of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. But here is Moses sitting by a well. Here's why I think this is important to the story. Sometime we need a change of scenery to see different. Are, are you with me? Sometimes we need a change of scenery to see different. Some of you have traveled this world or traveled this country and, and you forget how beautiful Middle Tennessee is until you go somewhere else. And, and yes, it's beautiful in a different way. You know, I, when I traveled to Hawaii, I, people would say, well, what's it like? I said, oh, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. It's beautiful in a way it's hard to describe. You know, it's a different kind of foliage and it's a different kind of topography. And, uh, but, but it is beautiful. But guys, sometimes I think we forget where we are because we can't see where we are. And recently, some of you have only seen the same four walls. I have been Zooming with some of my students uh, at the end of last semester. We, we met virtually online. And the only thing I ever saw in that house, and it's okay that that's the only thing I ever saw, was the same wall behind them. I had no picture of what their life looked like. Uh, I, some of them I saw things on the wall that I, I, I didn't realize they had as hobbies and, and interests. But sometimes we need, and so guys, God is actually taking Moses somewhere to give him a change of scenery so he can see differently. I'm going to tell you right here, and Tracy will back me up on this, and my parents happen to be here today, I'm not good with change. How about you? I kind of like the same things every day the same way. But sometimes God says, you need to see something different because you are locked into a view. I want you to look for a moment, and you can just look at the slides, or you can turn there if you want. We're going to stay in Exodus. But in Acts chapter 7, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, now not our Stephen, right? Stephen, in the book of Acts, is preaching a sermon. Stephen lets us know a little detail about this situation that isn't in Exodus. You see, sometimes I think we forget there are stories in the Old Testament, and they're commented on in the New Testament. 
Stephen in Acts chapter 7 verse 23 tells us a little more about the story. I'll just listen for a moment. Now when he was 40 years old, Moses was 40 when these events happened. I don't know where you are in your journey, but at 40 he had lived pretty much a good life and a life that he knew. When Moses was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. Moses saw injustice, and he stepped up to help, and in the end, unfortunately, it turned to violence. You know that happens sometimes? We think we've stepped in to do the right thing, and it ends up we did the wrong thing. Look at verse 25. Here's why I did it. The Exodus story doesn't tell us. We have to go to Acts. The the Acts story says, For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Moses stood up to that Egyptian, and I don't know that he meant to kill him, but it happened, and he thought the children of Israel would say, Ah, a leader! Someone to take us from here, this slavery, to somewhere else. Surely this is Moses. But do you notice the reaction of the two men the next day? Who made you judge over us? It wasn't the reaction he expected. Maybe some of you have tried to do good for someone and you got your head bit off. It wasn't the reaction you expected. Moses tries to do something here and he supposes he's on the right track it goes off track but then the people don't follow him continue on in the story if you will remember Moses is now sitting by a well in the land of Midian if you're following on the slides you can see where Midian is it's nowhere near Egypt it's not near Jerusalem it's way into what we think of today as Saudi Arabia Right, Way on the other side of of the Sinai Peninsula. He goes out to hang out with the Midianites. Now those Midianites are descendants of Abraham through Keturah. They're one of Keturah's children. And so they actually have some relations way back up the line, right? A common story way back up the line. And he finds himself over there, and it's different than where he left. Remember, he left Egypt, the most advanced civilization of their time, to go live in the wilderness And he finds himself by a well. And while he's at that well, Exodus 2, 16 says, Now the priest of Midian. Now don't be surprised by that. Guys, God was doing things in other people's lives. I think sometimes we read the Bible and we follow Joseph and we follow the children of Israel and we follow Moses and we think God is only in that story. No, there are other priests. We've talked about Melchizedek, right? Who was a high priest and a king. There were other believers Not not all of them wound up in Egypt. And so out in Midian, descendants of Abraham were still believing and still had priests. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. I know some of you live in houses with only other women, right? Maybe you only have daughters. Had seven daughters and they came and drew water and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. So do you see the story? These girls come. I'm guessing he doesn't have sons because they're the shepherds. They've filled the troughs with water from the well. And just as everything's full and it's time for the sheep to drink, another group of shepherds come in and push the women back. And they're going to steal the water. Guys, water's heavy. And they're hauling it up in clay jars and dumping it into troughs for these sheep. So this has been a workout. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up, remember he's at the well, and helped them and watered their flock. As we continue to read in this story, on that day, of all days, right? Moses, the Egyptian, left the land, finds himself in Midian, and is at the well at the time that someone needs help. Again, Moses saw an injustice. Have you noticed three times in this story Moses has seen injustice? Once when an Egyptian beats a Hebrew, and he steps in to help, And it doesn't go the way he thought it would. The second time when two Hebrews are fighting and he steps in to help and it doesn't go the way he thought it would. Yet on the third time he still steps in when he sees injustice. And this time the story goes a little bit different. These daughters, these daughters were there. 
This is the third time that he stepped up for us. Notice he didn't stop. Any of you ever done good for someone and got your head bit off? Did you stop? Is that the last time you did good for somebody? I mean, in fourth grade, you loaned a kid a pencil, and he said, I don't need your pencil. And you've never done good since then? No, we often are trying to stand up for injustice or do things for those that have been marginalized. And we may not always get the rea reaction we expect. Go back to Exodus chapter 2, verse 18. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, how is that you've come so soon today? I love this passage. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you I'm about to be in trouble. Are you with me? Those of you who are other places, feel free to laugh. Those of you in here, feel free to laugh. I did not know that my parents were coming to hear me today until oh, a couple of days ago. I'd already been working on this, okay? So I'm going to tell a story today on myself, all right? It's probably something my mama already knows, but I'm going to tell the story anyway, all right? So, so here we go. Any of you ever been assigned a chore list and you knew exactly how long it took what to do the chore? Do any of you remember snow days? You ever remember like snow days? You were stuck at home. Well, my mom, my sister and I would be at home and she would give us a list of chores to do and um, she would go to work and we would be there. You know, our lunch was in the refrigerator, all that kind of thing. My sister and I knew about how long it would take to do those chores. We also knew exactly when mom would pull in the driveway. Now, I know what you're thinking. We started those chores early in the morning and spaced them out throughout the day, right? No, what did we do? We knew exactly how long it would take. We waited and looked at the clock and did the math. And then as soon as we figured, she, and you know, sometimes, can you believe she came home early sometimes? Can y'all believe that? Yeah, just messed up the whole thing, right? Ruel says to her, why are you back? So, how, how, you know, I know how long it takes to draw water. Into the, well, why are you back early today? And they said an Egyptian, notice that, probably Moses' speech, Moses' look, the way he was dressed, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. So he said to his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him. Then he, He's done something good for you. Guys, this was the third time Moses had done something good, and no one had rewarded him. The, the, the Hebrews had not stood up and said, yes, kill the Egyptians, Moses. They had not stood up and said, oh, thank you for being our judge. These women had not even said, would you like to come home and have a meal? It's Ruel, whose name means a friend of God, who says, girls, don't you know your manners? Where is he? Go, go invite him. Verse 21, verse 21, are you with me? Then Moses was content. Forty years old away from his home. Forty years old away from the palace. Forty years old away from the center of the universe in his day. And Moses found contentment. Are you content this morning? In the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of an upcoming election, in the midst of going back to work, uh, in the midst of whatever the transition is, are you content this morning? Then Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses. Now, I love that. Moses has just been introduced to a family that has seven girls. That could have been a movie right there. What do you think? Some of you ladies, you think any of the other girls flirted too, like to see if they could get Moses? I don't know how many men were out there in the desert, right? But Zipporah is given, and she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom. It means a stranger here. Poor Moses, he's not really Hebrew, right, because he was raised by the Egyptians. He's not really Egyptian because he came from the Hebrews, and now he's out in Midian, and he's not really a Midianite either because he's from Egypt, but yet he knows their, their customs and their culture. I mean, he, he just really doesn't have a home. For I have been a stranger in a strange land. You can look on the slides there, and you can see Moses' generations. You can see uh, Moses' family tree, if you're interested in that. Moses is part of a larger story. It's not the only story going on, but it is a part of a larger story. Let's continue our reading, Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Ooh, things changed back home. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Guys, did you see the story switch? We've been on Moses. 
And it's kind of like in a TV show. Now the scene has switched and the camera is back in Egypt on the children of Israel who've still been undergoing harsh treatment, who've still been undergoing other things. But a new Pharaoh comes to power. And remember, Pharaoh is not a person. It's a title. And the children of Israel begin to cry out. I didn't know, again, that my parents were going to be here. I'm going to talk about telephones. My dad, for many years, worked in the telephone company. And so on screen, I have two pictures of a telephone, one of which most of you lived with the large part of your life. Most of you remember what was called, we call it today a home phone. We never called it a home phone because none of us had what? Any other kind of phone. And it would ring, and do you know what you did? You answered it. <laughs> You answered it not knowing who the caller was. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a life that was like that? You know, the home phone was horrible. For our teenagers that are listening out there, the home phone, if you wanted to call a girl, you had to call the home phone and you prayed the whole time that her mom or dad did not answer, right? And if they did answer, what did they always say? May I ask who's calling? And you're thinking, oh, I don't want to give my name, right? Because what if dad has the phone and he says, hello, Jennifer, it's Daryl calling. And you hear in the background Jennifer say, tell him I'm not home. <laughs> right, right? I don't know if that happened to any of you. I click. Today, how do we answer our phones? The first thing we do is what? We look at who it is. We look at who it is. And some of you send it directly to voicemail, right? And if it says unknown caller, you don't answer it at all. You realize God answers all of our calls? God answers all of our calls. He never looks at the number and says, I don't have time for that one. Not them again. It says the children of Israel were crying out and that God, it's not that God forgot them. Maybe it had been a while since they had called him. Maybe it had been a while since they had called him. What about when God calls you? Do you recognize his number? Do you recognize his calling? As we continue today, I could read these passages that are there on the slides, but I'm going to read all those today. Those are the promises God had made to Abraham and God had made to Isaac and God had made to Jacob. He told them, I will be your God and you will be my people and then I will get you to a place and I will bring you to a promised land. And remember, though, it's been several hundred years since Joseph and Jacob had taken the children of Israel to Egypt. But God answered when the people cried out. He heard their suffering. Guys, pray. Pray. And pray bigger than yourself. Are you with me, church? This is something I thought about when I saw that passage. What were they praying? Were they individually praying, God, get me out of slavery? Or were they praying, God, get us out of slavery? How many of you have had a disease and you've prayed that God would heal you of the disease? Have you ever prayed that God would help a scientist in a lab somewhere far away find a cure for everyone who had the disease? I don't know if I've ever thought about that before. Many of my prayers are what? About me and the things that are affecting me. I don't know that sometimes I, I forget to pray for the bigger things. But God answered their prayers when the people called out. So what can we learn from these Hebrew slaves? Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 said, Now these things happened to them as, exa <clears throat> excuse me, as example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. God puts things in the Bible to let us know it's going to be okay. Someone once said, Dumb people don't learn from others' mistakes. Really dumb people don't learn from their own mistakes. Any of you been there? Any of you been there? Smart people learn from others' mistakes. Really smart people learn from their own mistakes. Why are these stories in the Bible? So that we can see them and watch them and learn from them. Guys, I want you to leave here today seeing this part of the story. This is a part of the story that you might miss if I don't bring it together for you. God is doing two things in this story. God is doing two things in this story. He is working with a man by a well with some women and some sheep, and he is going to become a shepherd and have a family. 
And he is working with the kingdom of Egypt by letting a Pharaoh live and a Pharaoh die and a new Pharaoh come to town and people still being slaves. Neither of them knew at that moment in the story that they would come back together. Now, are you with me, church? Many times you are praying for God to do something in your life, in your situation. And over here, God is doing something. God is preparing something. God is answering something in someone else's life so that those two things can come together and the answer can be whole. The problem is we only see our story. I don't think Moses was out there going, you know, one day I'm going back to Egypt and I'm going to show them what a leader looks like. No, he's living his life out there in the wilderness in Midian with sheep. And the children of Israel, they've long forgotten about a man who came in and killed an Egyptian one day and buried him in the sand. Their life has gone on. I don't think any of them are sitting there going as they're making bricks one day. You know what I was thinking about the other day? Whatever happened to that Moses guy? I wonder if he's going to come back and say, but no. But guys, God is often working in multiple. So you ever wonder why God calls us together as a family? God calls us together as a church. Because this week he was working in your life so you can help someone. You ever had someone say something to you at church and you went, wow, I needed to hear that. Or a sermon. You know, God works with Steve and I and, and sometimes we preach a sermon and, and we don't know why. We don't know why we said that sentence because we'd not practiced that sentence. We'd not thought of that sentence. But some of you have come up right after service and said what? I needed to hear that. Guys, God is working in multiple stories to bring about his story. So, let's close the story, if you will, with me today. Now Moses, Exodus 3, 1. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Forty years, Moses is an Egyptian. Forty years, Moses is a shepherd. He's 80 years old. Now, I have a map here that I want you to see. I, did, I, I learned something this week. And when I learn, I like to share with you. I don't know that I'd ever put this together before. This is where God is doing things that we never imagined. I want you to look, if you can see the map today, I want you to look at Midian. Midian is one place, but Moses is tending the flocks of this man, and he's tending them over at Mount Horeb, miles away. And guys, Mount Horeb's name later in the Bible becomes Mount Sinai. Now, for those of you who know the Bible story, I hope your head hurts. God is letting Moses spend years around a mountain, getting to know the geography, getting to know the topography, getting to know the mountain, where one day he will come back and receive the Ten Commandments. Wonder what it is God has led you through, and you wondered, why did I have to go through that? Why, why did that happen to me? Is it possible God was leading you through a landscape? So you could lead someone else through the same thing and they wouldn't be as lost as you were. Guys, the children of Israel are going to wander 40 years in that area. And you know who had been there before? Moses. God was preparing the children of Israel a tour guide who had already been there. I don't know that I'd ever noticed that in the story before. That may be new to some of you. And so some of you may be sitting in this room this morning. And you may be wondering... What is it that God is preparing me for? I, I don't know that I can tell you. I know what God was preparing Moses for. God was preparing Moses to come into contact with him after 40 years of being shepherd. He was coming to contact with him at a burning bush. And as we close today, I want to look at the very last slide. And I want to remind you of the things that we learned from Moses today. I want you to look at the leadership principles today. Effective kingdom-led leaders, they hate injustice. Guys, I know there's a lot of not fair going on right now. No, it may not be fair, some of the things that we're having to do or some of the things that are happen happening to people. But kingdom leaders hate injustice. They struggle with holiness over sinfulness. Here's what I want you to hear. I know the Bible does not record Moses repenting. Are you with me, church? But I know he did. And the reason I know he did is because God couldn't have used him if he had not. And God is consistent. I do wish there was a passage that said, and Moses went to God and said, God, I shouldn't have killed that guy, and I'm really sorry, and can you forgive me? It's not in there. 
But how I know that Moses had some time to reflect on that may have been the 40 years he was out as a shepherd. And one day it came to him that he shouldn't have. Remember, he thought he was doing good. He thought he was going to rise up the children of Israel and they were, they were going to leave the land of Pharaoh. It may have taken him a while to realize I was wrong. But I know that he struggled with holiness over sinfulness. I know he repented of sin and he sought spiritual restoration. And that's why God calls him in Exodus 3. And we're going to put that part online next week. That'll be our Bible study next week. He defended the helpless. Guys, some of us have found people in our society during this time that have been helpless. People who couldn't go to grocery stores because of their health condition. People who couldn't go get their medicine because of health conditions. Children who can't enroll in school because of families' health. We have found those that are helpless. Are you helping? Are you helping? Moses also worked through disappointment. He thought at 40 he was going to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Do you know he does it when he's 80? Any of you willing to wait 40 years for a promise to happen? For God to actually be able to use you? Some of you right now be saying, you know, God just hasn't used me a lot lately. I, I just don't feel, maybe you're in a story that he's planning out that you're going to come in contact with someone else in another story. And when it happens, it's going to happen at the right time and at the right moment. And God will be blessed through that story. And so I encourage you in this time of COVID or pandemic or worship today to wait patiently for God's next assignment. Boy, that's the hard one, isn't it? We want things just to be over. We want things to go back to the way they were. Guys, it may have taken 40 years for Moses to have got the Egyptianness out of him so he could go back and be a Hebrew. I don't know. What I do know is when God was ready for him, he was there. And can I be honest with you? Next week you're going to see in the story, even though God is ready for him, Moses isn't sure he's ready. And we're going to see Moses step up with excuses. This morning, I close with these thoughts. Where's your story? Where's your story? Where's your leadership? What is the landscape that you're getting to stop and see in a time you normally would not have? And do you realize that may be so valuable in the future to someone else's story? We have cancer survivors in this congregation. And we have those who will be diagnosed with cancer in this congregation. We have those who have had broken relationships in this congregation, and we will have those that go through broken relationships in this congregation. And if I may be so bold, we have sinners in this congregation, and we have those who have been forgiven of sin in this congregation. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what our story is. God calling his people together in order to serve, even when we don't understand it, even when it seems like it's a land far away and strange, but God is a keeper of promises, and he brings his people together for reconciliation. That is our lesson today. If you need to be reconciled, we'll stick around after service. I'll be glad to come out to your car, Stephen, one of the elders, um, whatever it may take this morning for you to be right. But as we begin to concentrate on what God did for us, let's go back to that phrase I used earlier. Moses may have thought he was discounted because he killed someone. Any of you ever been to the grocery store and seen a dented can? You ever seen a dented can and you thought, ooh, this is the dented can? I don't know if they still sell dented cans, right? But you could get them what? You could get them cheaper. Some of you may have known where that section was in the grocery store. You went back and you said, ooh, the dented cans. I'm going to get that. Maybe you dropped a can and dented it. I don't know. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. But do you know God doesn't think of you as discounted? He didn't buy you at a discount. He paid full price. He paid full price, the price of his son. God doesn't see you as damaged. God sees you as worthy. And in just a moment, we'll remember what God bought us with.